Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I'm Wilmer Leon. Here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they occur in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode of this broadcast, my guests and I will have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between current events and the broader historic context in which they occur. This will enable you to better understand and analyze the events that impact the global village in which we live. On today's episode, according to my guest, self-proclaimed Zionist Joe Biden, with no wits about him, is assuring the destruction of Zionist apartheid Israel. As corrupt U.S. intel leaders have unleashed the dogs of war, we cannot be bystanders. Quote, indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. That's Rabbi Abraham Heschel. For insight into this, let's turn to my guest. He leads the Speaking Truth to Power section of Tell the Word, a publishing arm of the Ecumenical Church of the Savior in inner city Washington. He served as a CIA analyst for 27 years, his duties including chairing the national intelligence estimates and preparing the president's daily brief. And he also ran the Russia desk uh, for the CIA. And in January of 2003, he co-created Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, better known as VIPs. He is Ray McGovern. Ray, welcome, and let's connect some dots. Thanks, Dr. Lear. Ray, you recently published a piece at raymcgovern.com entitled, Can You Give a Brief Synopsis of What's Happening in Israel? And it's based upon a response to a question from, I believe, your youngest daughter. She asked you to explain to her what's happening in occupied Palestine. And it opens as follows. I was nine years old, 1948, when there was huge celebration in the Bronx at the founding of the state of Israel. No one told me that Arabs had lived on that land for centuries and were displaced by force. Tens of thousands of them crammed into postage stamped Gaza and now host to millions of Palestinians. Ray, I'll throw it to you. Why was it so important for you to write this piece? Wilmer, uh, frankly, I was really encouraged that one of my children, and we have five, was interested in knowing what I thought about this. <laughs> <laughs> Prophets are without renown in their hometowns and sometimes in their own homes. So uh, when Miriam asked me this question, I said, well, you know, uh, she wants a short, concise paragraph, so I'll try. And I failed. <laughs> I couldn't do it in one concise paragraph. I said, look, here's somebody who's genuinely interested. She has three young children. She's got a very busy life, but she knows that this is important. So let me, let me explain some of the background to this. And so I, I started out first with the so-called religious justification for what Israel did, well, in occupying lands already occupied by Palestinian people for centuries before. Um, I, I have been in the West Bank. I have been in Israel. Uh, at one point, we went up a hill to a Jewish settlement um, this is about eight years ago. Now, at the bottom of the hill, there was devastation. There was no running water. There was poverty of an extreme kind. When we went up to the top of the hill, whoa, look like a golf course, for God's sake. Uh, green lawns being watered, okay? And a rabbi from Cleveland <laughs> telling us why. Uh, why he's entitled to be there as a settler. So um, one of my colleagues, we were on a little delegation, said, well, Rabbi, um, how do you explain uh, the conditions right down at the bottom of this hill in Palestinian territory and, and your, your beautiful uh, settlement up here? 
And he said, without hesitation, well, God promised us this land. Now, I had heard that before, and I know not enough about the what's so-called the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, but I knew this. I knew that they depend on Deuteronomy 15.4 for that. <laughs> so I raised my head, Rabbi, uh, please cite the part of scripture that justifies your settling on this land. And he said, oh, that's easy. He said, uh, uh, Yahweh said to the Jewish people, you shall have this land flowing with milk and honey. And I said, continue, Rabbi, continue. <laughs> uh, and he said, what do you mean continue? I said, well, you're only giving us half of the deal, right? He said, well, uh, what do you mean? I said, read the rest of the verse. And so, read it. so there shall be no poor among you. He said, oh, oh. Rabbi, you forgot to. So, so it was a deal, huh? It was, well, you might call it a covenant, all right? You shall have this land so that there shall be no poor among you. And I thought that Miriam should know this, that when she hears people say, oh, wait a second, God promised this stuff. It was a deal, and the Israelis, of course, have broken that deal in a, in a scurrilous way. So that's the way I started out. I went into some of the more recent history. Um, but, you know, you go back to the Hebrew scriptures, it's very clear uh, what God's promise was, assuming you think this is important, and, of course, the settlers think it's important that's why they always that's why they always cite it you know you know ray two things one uh, it would be one thing if the scripture said i will give you this land of milk and honey so that you will not be poor but that's not what it says it says so that there will not be poor among you and there's a, also a reason why uh, those individuals are called settlers. And there's also a reason why that region is called the occupied territories. That's right, Wilmer. And, you know, it's an embarrassing history we Americans have because we were settlers on a land peopled by Native Americans. And we kind of pushed them aside just as Israel has pushed the Palestinians aside. So it's it's not a happy history. But when you're you're a settler, well, that's a nice way of putting that you're coming from, from outside and you've displaced people who have a right to live on mm -hmm. those lands. So, you know, uh, when, as I said in the beginning of this piece, you know, I came from the Bronx. I lived there for my first 22 years before I went in and served in a, as an army officer. Now, um, when I was nine years old, 1948, oh, man, it was, it was sort of like the 4th of July 10 times over. Israel had a home, right? And you know, as I noted at the beginning, well, nobody told me. Nobody told me that it was not a, a land for people, a, a land without any people in it. Well, there were people in it. And, you know, that's the basic point of all this. And... You know, if you go more recent in history, you know, I was serving as a CIA analyst in 1967 uh, when the Israelis uh, attacked Egypt and Syria, decimated their air force, and enlarged Israeli territory to include parts of Syria, to include the West Bank, to include the Sinai, to include Gaza, lots of places to include, all right? <laughs> okay, now, um, we thought, or we were told, uh, that Egypt was about to attack Israel. Well, that was the, the legends uh, put forward mm -hmm. for many years after 1967. But finally, um, Menachem Begin, a former Israeli prime minister, got up um, before an audience in Washington in 1982. And, you know, call it chutzpah, <laughs> call it honesty, call it uh, a cleansing of his conscience. But this is what he said. <laughs> it's not long. I want to read it so that I don't mess it up. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Menachem Begin, former Israeli prime minister. Quote, in June 1967, we had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai approaches do not prove that Sinasso is ready, really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him, period, end quote. It was duly reported in the New York Times, and people in New York uh, and us, elsewhere where I was living, they oh, isn't that interesting? So, they, so the Israelis said, well, that's called aggression. That's called creating Lebensraum, okay, not terribly dissimilar from what happened in the 30s at the hands of the Nazis in Germany. And so that's the truth behind all this. Now, how did the UN react then? back in 67 when all this happened. There was the unanimous Security Council resolution, Resolution 242, that called for Israel to withdraw from the the occupied territories. Uh, Was it a close vote? It was unanimous, okay? Uh, Did the Israelis do that? No, they didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? because of chutzpah, because the Israelis uh, can always depend on the United States to defend them no matter what they do. And so they have occupied all those territories. They gave back the Sinai uh, to Egypt when there was an agreement under Jimmy Carter, but the Sinai is not worth keeping actually. (laughs) Now the people in Gaza are bearing the brunt of this this occupation, um, this uh, oppression. And uh, as I I quoted uh, Rabbi Heschel, one of my very favorite people who marched with Dr. King back in the late 60s, that, uh, you know, we're not all guilty, uh, but we are all responsible. Uh, How did I put it? Or how did he put it? Uh, Indifference to evil is worse than evil itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to measure up to this time. Uh, there's been evil in the, the uh, in Gaza, and we have to make sure that we don't one-sidedly accuse one side and give the other a a free a free ride, so to speak, as has been the case since the U.S. reacted to the U.N. resolution. It didn't do diddly, as we say in the Bronx, to enforce it. There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of disinformation and outright lies that are being used in support of the Zionist U.S. narrative of this illegal occupation of Palestine, as well as the genocide of Palestinians. I want to read a brief statement and then show a map before I come back to you. Here's a statement. This is from the Foreign Office, the 2nd of November, 1917, and it reads, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have Much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation, yours, Arthur James Balfour. Now, this is known as the Balfour Declaration. The British government decided in 1917 to endorse the establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine, not Israel, Palestine. After discussions within the cabinet and the consulting with the Jewish leaders, the decision was made public and we have this letter. Uh, To that point, here's a map from National Geographic from 1947, where you can see Lebanon, Syria, Transjordan, Egypt, and Palestine. Israel is not on this map. Why? Because contrary to the dominant Western narrative, Israel did not exist. That's why we know now 
Israel is actually the occupied territories. Ray, uh, I, people will have a tendency to try to categorize this conversation as anti-Semitic, which is why if we can put the map back up one more time, I want to be sure that people see this map. This is history. This is not narrative. This is not rhetoric. This is history. Ray McGovern. Well, history can be very anti-Semitic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's hard to hard to realize that most Americans are, are blissfully unaware of all this. The maps show the story. Now, the situation right now is different. Mm -hmm. How is it different? Well, the the Soviets, I, I used to be a, a, a Soviet analyst, an analyst of Russian uh, foreign policy. The Soviets used to talk about a concept called uh, the correlation of forces. Now, it's not it's it's not uh, it's not rocket science. OK, it had to do with the balance of power in the world. Now, guess what, folks? The balance of power in the world has shifted, okay? Uh, people are now talking about a shift from a unipolar world, which mm -hmm. is what the US was since World War II and particularly since the, the Soviet Union fell apart, okay? To a multipolar world where other countries are allowed to have a say in these things. Well, I look at, at it as a bipolar world. And I would refer more recently just to the yesterday's vote at the UN where the US was the only one to veto a resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, calling for the Israelis not to ethnically cleanse uh, Gaza as they apparently still intend to do. So what am I, what's my point? My point is that everyone not even the British voted with us this time, okay? 12 to 1 was the with two abstentions. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the Arab countries, uh, well, here's, a, here's an example. The Arab ambassadors in Beijing asked the Chinese, please get us all together. We need to talk about what's going to happen in Gaza, and the Chinese did. The head of Iran calls up arch rival, the head of Saudi Arabia, and says, you know, we got to do something about this. And they have a cordial conversation, okay? Next thing you know, he's talking to the head of Hamas. He's talking to the head of Hezbollah, okay? Um, so there are, there are things that are happening here where, you know, it's, it's a, a no-brainer, where this, the deck is being stacked heavily against the United States and, and its satraps like uh, the UK and France and Germany, they're not very long for this world, those governments, okay? So what we have here is a, is a, a condition where uh, 20 years ago, the U.S. could work its will, okay? No longer can it. Hamas is well-equipped. Uh, I don't uh, think that uh, killing civilians is a good idea. Nor but, do you I. Know, when you, when you look at it, uh, when you look at it, you say, well, was this uh, unprovoked? <laughs> yeah. Unprovoked seems to be the, the adjective of choice here, okay? Just as Pucci's decision to defend his compatriots in the Donbass was not unprovoked, uh, neither was Hamas's reaction here, uh, without making any moral judgments, is, which is something that intelligence analysts are not called to do, actually. Mm -hmm. We can say you can understand this, given the, the recent history and the more distant history that we've referred to earlier. I, I, I'm very glad that, that you put it that way, because um, a lot of times people misconstrue, and I'll just put this on a personal level. I'm not a I'm not a former, I'm not an intelligence analyst, but I, I am a political scientist, not a political operative. And so people have a tendency to misconstrue my explanation of events 
with my agreeing with the events, my saying, I understand why President Putin and Russia went into Ukraine. I understand it because I understand the history. I understand why Hamas took the actions that it did. I don't condone the killing of civilians. I don't, con I don't condone the killing of children, but I understand why Hamas did what they did. Um, if you could quickly, Tony Blinken, you were just talking about the shift from the unipolar to the multipolar world. Talk a little bit about Tony Blinken and this whole concept of the rules-based order, because Tony Blinken and the Biden administration, they love to talk about the rules-based order, but when you try to find a definition of it, you can't because it only exists in the mind of Tony Blinken. They rarely talk about international law. They always want to talk about the rules-based order. You put your finger on it. Uh, the rules-based international order. Well, it's a contrived expression. It's meant to substitute for international law and the United Nations. Uh, it was invented by Blinken and Sullivan and Nolan. And uh, I mean, Putin, and Lavrov, the foreign minister, have made fun of it. Well, you know, tell us about this. Uh, we looked, at, we try to Google it, but we don't. <laughs> Could you please give us? Uh, can you give us a piece of paper to describe what the rules-based international order? And of course, they can. And what it means is, what we say goes. We make the rules, and and that's it. And you so, follow our <laughs> orders. <laughs> yeah, people are getting wise to that. An uh, increasing number of people witness the. The vote at the UN yesterday, 12 to 1, the one being the United States. You know, the saving grace here, as I see it, is that the UN is still being respected by China, by Russia, and by some of the other countries that are, are insisting that we abide by UN regulations. First and foremost, in this context, UN Security Council Resolution 242 of November 22nd, 1967, ordering is to relinquish control of the occupied territories that they seized in 1967. So what's the hope here? Well, the hope was yesterday. The US, uh, <laughs> US talks about Russia being isolated. <laughs> Look, and you know, maybe, just maybe, uh, these Zionists, and I'll use that word advisedly. I mean, Joe Biden has bragged about being a real died in the wool Zionist. So has mm -hmm. Blinken and Sullivan, the rest of them. Okay. What does that mean? That means the people that occupied the Palestinian territories, occupied by Palestinians for as just as Native Americans in our example, four centuries before. It doesn't make sense, and it's not going to make any. It's not going to make any headway, no matter how much we invoke this <laughs> rules-based international order. Thanks for raising that, uh, because it's uh, it's very telling how we thought that we could just invent a new a, a new phrase and substitute it for international law and the UN. Uh, President Biden, when he went to the region on this so-called peacekeeping tour, or wherever in the heck. He was supposed to be doing. He he talked about peace. Uh, and to your point, earlier on, not on this trip, but earlier on, he was very clear. I am a Zionist. And then Tony Blinken goes and he says, I am here not only as the uh, Secretary of State of the United States, but I'm here as a Jew. What message do you think that sends to the Arabs? in the region who he allegedly is supposed to be trying to find some common ground with and bring about some type of peaceful resolution to this conflict. Well, I think the word is chutzpah <laughs> uh, and naivete. If 
Blinken doesn't know how that goes over with the Arab uh, leaders that he's talking to. You know, he's he's hopelessly blind. Wait a minute, um, wait a minute, Ray. Does he? Yeah. Does he care? Because what that I, I remember very clearly, probably two years ago, when Blinken went to Anchorage, Alaska, to meet with the Chinese delegation, and the Chinese delegation got up and said, "We're not going to sit here and let you lecture us." We're China. We don't have to sit here and listen to you. And they got up and walked out of the room. That, to me, sounds eerily reminiscent, uh, or what just transpired with Tony Blinken in the Middle East sounds eerily reminiscent to what he tried to do with the Chinese. Well, uh, Wilmer, you probably have seen uh, uh, President Biden reading from his little notes uh, even in a very short mm -hmm. session with Netanyahu. So who writes the notes? Tony Blinken. Well, Blinken <laughs> writes the notes. Uh, Victoria Nuland. Victoria Nuland. Now, what do Jake Blinken Sullivan. and Victoria Nuland have in common? What does Jacob Sullivan have in common? They're all of Jewish extraction. Now, should that ordinarily matter? No. Does it matter now? It happens to matter now. We're talking about a Jewish homeland created at the expense of the Palestinian people. We're talking about Zionism, which is a political movement, mm -hmm. not a religion. Mm -hmm. So the three top people at the State Department have traditionally been Zionists, not only Jews, but Zionists. Now, this is not lost on, on the Middle East leaders or China or Russia. And you could see their hold on Biden from the very first part of his <laughs> of his uh, administration. The first thing he did, we got up and he said, "Now uh, China, China is going to be has aspirations to be the the most powerful country in the world. Not only economically, but strategically. That's not going to happen on my watch." <laughs> okay. Next thing he does. Is he, he lets himself be set up by Stephanopoulos, George Stephanopoulos, who said, no, no, Mr. President, uh, you think uh, Putin's a killer? And by the, oh, yeah, yeah, he's a killer. Okay. And then they meet with the Chinese at Anchorage and read them the riot act about the rules, basically. And, and the Chinese say, you know, we know all about this. <laughs> We spent a century throwing off your predecessors, the British, selling with the gun to both the plumbers. That's over, folks. And as you say, they didn't put up with it. So you have, at the very outset of his administration, uh, laying down the line, look, we're, we're all powerful, which is not the case anymore. We're Zionists, which happens to be the case anymore. I think... Let me adduce one sort of comment that Biden made without reading from his uh, little cards there. I think it was on the plane coming home yesterday. You know, he said, uh, you know, I, had, I made a note of it. He says, you know, I can understand why people in the Mideast region would not believe the Israelis. <laughs> or that maybe the bombing of that hospital was not intentional. Huh? You know, <laughs> well, I can understand why the people of that region would not believe the Israeli. The question is why you believe him, Joe Biden. And, you know, whether, whether, J now, Jacob Sullivan, you know, I have to tell you, uh, people object to my saying Jacob Sullivan, uh, but that's his first name, okay? Mm -hmm. Just like, remember Scooter Libby, who worked for Cheney? His first name was Israel Libby. So why does he go by Scooter? Why does Jacob go by Jake? I don't know, but I can make a little guess here, okay? Jacob Sullivan is Zionist as, as the Nolans and the Blinkens of this world, and of course, the president who, who styles himself as the Supreme Zionist. What does that mean? Well, it means that it's over with the US and Israel. It's just gonna take a couple of months now for people to realize that. And that the fear I have, uh, Wilmer, the fear I have is that uh, there's too much at stake personally mm -hmm. for President Biden 
and for Blinken and Nod and Sullivan and Nolan uh, and Hunter Biden, there's too much at personal stake for them to, to go away quietly and acknowledge the new correlation of forces. If they lose the wars, if they lose the election, they could end up in jail. The evidence is there in court documents, in sworn testimony, bribery, impeachment proceedings may go forward. So what am I saying? I don't give a rat's patootie about what happens in impeachment consideration. What I care about is how they are likely to react to save their own their own patooties, okay? And that introduces a, an element of instability and personal stake that worries me greatly. And, you know, it doesn't matter what worries McGovern greatly. I'm sure it worries Russian and Chinese leads, leaders greatly too, and has them on tenterhooks as to what will happen over the next year. When you look at the surveys right now, when you look at the polling data, uh, the the, the, the race for, 24, for 2024 between uh, President Biden and former President Trump, by most, uh, by most polls, is a dead heat. Uh, it's within one or two points. It's, it's within the margin of error. Uh, history tells us that uh, countries tend not to shift leadership or change leadership in the midst of conflict slash war. You mentioned if they lose the election, I'm sorry, you mentioned if they lose the war, if they lose the election. Does Joe Biden need this conflict in his mind in order to save his administration? I don't think Joe Biden is compass mentis. I think that Blinken and Sullivan, Nolan, they are extremely compass mentis, okay? They have a lot to fear. Uh, let's say that uh, Trump uh, wins the election. As I said before, the evidence is out there, not only not only of bribery and those kinds of things and Hunter Biden's laptop and, and the inclusion of uh, corrupt former intelligence officials and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, um, Blinken, was personally involved in arranging for Biden to win via a subterfuge. What do I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, when Hunter Biden's uh, laptop was revealed and the scurrilous repeat stuff on it and his dealings with uh, calling uh, his father's brand name into it, well, how did they decide to handle that? It was three weeks before the election. Oh, what happened? Well, by testimony to Congress by a former acting director of the CIA. His name is Mikey Morell. He said, I got a call from Tony Blinken. And he said, you know, the best way to handle the Hunter Biden laptop is could you get former intelligence directors uh, to say that it has all the uh, earmarks of a Russian intelligence disinformation operation? And Mikey Morell said, sure, I can do that. Three days later, Mikey Morell has rounded up 50, <laughs> count them, 50 former intelligence directors and very high officials. Speaks pretty poorly of them, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. 50 plus Mikey Morell. And he says 51 former intelligence directors, including four or five former directors of the CIA, as if that enhances their credibility, say this has all earmarks of a Russian intelligence disinformation operation. Now, was that consequential? Well, all I know is that two days later, uh, Joe Biden had his last uh, debate with, uh, with Trump. And Trump raised this. And <laughs> Biden said, oh, <laughs> don't you know that this is, this is an all the earmarks of a Russian intelligence operation. Now, why do I go into that detail? I mean, that should not have happened. Okay, I don't know right. whether that won the election for Biden or not, but you don't do these things. They have to be illegal in my view. So Blinken himself is on tenterhooks. He could be prosecuted. He could be put in jail. And Jacob Sullivan, just a word about him. He invented Russiagate. You know, the, 
the non-existent Russian hacking of the DNC computer for Hillary Clinton's emails and all that stuff that showed that she had that showed that she had stolen the nomination for Bernie Sanders. Yeah, you know, that was Sullivan. He was a big campaign manager for Hillary Clinton. So that's all out there. Now, I don't know if Trump came in, and I will not comment on what I think of Trump. If he came in, um, you know, he's he's not a he's not loath to um, to hold these people accountable. And on this case, he's got the law behind him. So again, there's great incentive on the part of all these people preparing the notes for Joe Biden to keep the war going in Ukraine and not lose before the election and to help the Israelis uh, to the degree uh, the U.S. can still uh, not lose in Gaza. The last one is not possible anymore. Neither is the first one. So what am I afraid of? I'm afraid that they will react uh, according to this personal stake they have. And, you know, it, it, it's happened before. Uh, when, you have a, when you have this kind of personal stake and you have advisors like these guys who are saying, Joe, look, if we lose this, look what happens. Then it, you don't have to write notes to Joe. He, he understands this. He's a politician. And that's what worries me. Sorry to carry on at that point, no, but no, no, I think no, this no. is an important aspect that's not really covered elsewhere. You are former intelligence official, and you understand the subtleties of diplomacy. And one of the things that I find very interesting is when you listen to President Putin, when you listen to President Xi, when you listen to Raisi in, in Iran, they speak in very subtle undertones. So when uh, Donald Trump assassinated General um, uh, Soleimani, Sole Soleimani uh, Iran said, "We're gonna we're gonna retaliate," and a lot of people expected the retaliation to be coming shortly thereafter. It did not come. Well, as Tony Blinken was traversing the Middle East recently, uh, the, the Iranian foreign minister was doing the same thing with his allies and released a statement saying, Israel, the time is up. Did that convey to you a not so subtle message that people need to be paying attention to? Well, it does. Uh, and that's really uh, one outstanding aspect of what happened over the last week. Uh, the, the notion that the president of Iran would call up the leader of Saudi Arabia to coordinate on what they're going to do. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a tectonic shift in the relations between those two countries. And, uh, you know, Raisi, the, the president of Iran, has, has been traveling all around. And he's got, uh, you know, he talks to uh, the Syrians and he talks to the Egyptians. And, and you know, the uh, actually the Egyptians and the, uh, and the Jordanians wouldn't even, wouldn't even receive Joe Biden uh, when he wanted to see them. So, you know, what we need to do is and, recognize... And, and, and and Mohammed bin Salman made Tony Blinken wait an entire day, actually overnight, because I guess he had gone fishing in somewhere in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> and he was on a fishing trip in Saudi Arabia and couldn't be bothered. Uh, so he made Tony that again from a diplomatic perspective. That's one of those not so subtle messages that says I really don't feel like being bothered with you. Yeah, and you know Saudi Arabia is very, very, very important not only because of the oil, but because of the rapprochement that was going on with China and with others. So you know maybe uh, maybe the Saudi foreign minister was supervising some beheadings in the public square, or you know you, you get pretty busy in Saudi Arabia. When heads in any start case, rolling. Uh, and I understand he did give uh, Blinken access to a men's room there as he waited. So I don't know, there, there, there's some niceties that were observed. 
but <laughs> keep a weed off night. You know, you don't do that with, at least you didn't used to do that with the Secretary of State of the United States of America, the least least of all would the Saudi Arabians have done that. So that's uh, just one little, uh, one little symptom of the tectonic shift in relations uh, where U.S. is no longer the unipolar uh, uh, power, um, but rather, uh, a, you know, a, a bipolar with them, uh, with the United States. And I, you know, I'm, I'm an American citizen. I really mourn the fact that because of our own, own ineptitude and chutzpah, uh, we put ourselves in this situation. And I dare say that the Israelis do what everyone thinks they're going to do now. It's going to be all hell to pay because the Iranians, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Egyptians, the uh, Hezbollah, uh, the, the others, even the Saudis, for God's sake, are not going to sit around and tolerate the decimation of two million people in Gaza. The uh, Yemen isn't going to be too too happy with this with this either. Yemen uh, as well, yeah. So, people watching this, people listening to this, they may be saying, "Wow, Wilmer, you, you and Ray are spending an awful lot of time talking about foreign policy, talking about the Middle East." You know, we have homelessness in 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 the United States. We we have we have abject poverty. We have all these. Uh, declines in the standard of living in the United States. Why spend so much time talking about this instead of talking about that? Well, because they're connected, as you well know. Uh, every billion you send to Ukraine, every billion you send to Israel is at the expense of these people, the poor people in our country that need all those, uh, all that kind of help. You know, um, there shall be no poor among you. Well, that's a universal. That's a universal in my view. Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a Hebrew scripture. I mean, the Christian, uh, the Christian, and I say Judeo-Christian uh, uh, attitude toward justice. You know, uh, Wilmer, we have this American concept of justice where you have this blind lady of all people holding these scales and the image is impartiality, image, no favoritism to one or the other. Now, let me tell you something and your, and your listeners, the Judeo-Christian, the biblical concept of justice is unbalanced and biased to the core in favor of the poor, the anawim, the, the hated poor. Of the, as, as the Old Testament. The very word in pre-Aramaic for justice, tetka, denotes, not kanotes, denotes showing mercy to the poor. Now, that used to be kind of observed. Uh, FDR, my father's favorite president, he cried when FDR died. Uh, he knew in his heart, what he needed to do for poor people. They brought, out, brought us out of that depression, okay? Mm -hmm. There used to be a, a Democratic Party that cared mostly about the poor. When I asked my father, I said, Dad, um, what's the difference between a Democrat and a Republican? He said, all oh, Democrats care about people, okay? Care about poor people. Well, that ain't the case anymore. They're all kind of all joined at the hip. And what do they care about? Stuffing their own pockets. Uh, you know, what was really a revelation to me was when Pope Francis came <laughs> to Congress, 2015, I think it was, and there was a joint section, right? And he stands up there, and to his credit, Pope Francis says, and I quote, the main problem today is the, let's see, called, is the blood-soaked arms trade. Okay. The main problem today is the blood-soaked arms trade, period, end quote. Now, what do those congressmen, what do the senators do? Oh, they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they say, oh, yeah, right. And they stood up, right? And then they looked in their, in their pockets. <laughs> envelope from Raytheon was still there, and the one from 
Lockheed over here, I mean, it was giving hypocrisy a bad name, okay? These guys know what the message was, but they're so soaked in this money and this power that it's going to take a lot of us, a lot of us who care about the poor, and a lot of us who can show um, what they call opportunity costs is what the economists use, okay? Mm -hmm. For every... For every uh, $150 million you spend on creating an F-35, what could be done in your school district to pay the, de the teachers a decent way? What could be do? Or what could be done in Iowa or Nebraska or any of these places which are being downtrodden, okay? The, people need to, to make this very specific. This money is going to these high... These people that are making $20, 30000000 million a year as salaries, as CEOs of Raytheon, Lockheed, General Dynamics, that ain't, that ain't sustainable. We need to get up and find out where these people live, shame them into relenting a little bit and saying, look, you know, uh, maybe, maybe $10 million is enough for your salary, and maybe we'll give the, the balance to the poor. So to round this thing up, uh, I happen to be out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, and this reinforces my, what's the word, my, my imperative uh, to, to honor the concept of justice, which is not balanced in favor of everybody because it's not a, lay, lay, it's not a level playing field. It's a unbalanced, it's biased and prejudiced to the core in favor of the poor. Now, that that's what I come out of as a faith perspective. And I'll just add one other thing. I had a Jesuit teacher who was a real good friend of mine. I said, well, how would you describe your theology? I said, oh, it's very simple. I can put it in one sentence. I said, what's that? He says, well, it all depends on what kind of God you believe in and how God feels when little people are pushed around, period, end quote. Okay, I'll say that again. And how God feels when little people are pushed around. Now, you don't have to believe in God. You could just believe in justice. I had agnostics and, and atheists tell me, look, Ray, you don't have to go into the Bible here. Human beings know that we're supposed to be fair. And that's true. Human beings used to know that we need to get back on the track here and do everything we can to make sure they realize that now, the more so since things are getting very, very perilous for us, not only in Ukraine, but in, in, in Western Asia, as it's called now. And in, in mentioning Ukraine, you also have a piece at your website, raymcgovern.com, entitled Fact Checking Putin on Ukraine. Uh, President Putin gave an interview right before he went to China uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative uh, Conference. And uh, you, you, you say media consumers should be permitted to learn what Putin said, particularly about Ukraine and Russia's problems dealing with various U.S. administrations over the years. Readers who rely on the, quote, paper of record, end quote, however, will be shielded from his remarks and thus <laughs> any temptation to ask if they might be true. And you went through uh, a lot of what, what uh, Russian President Putin had to say. You did your own fact-checking. And what were some of the conclusions uh, that you came to regarding uh, President Putin's, uh, the veracity of his comments? Well, uh, I checked them all, and there were two that I needed to consult others on because I wasn't 100% sure. One had to do with when Soviet, <laughs> Soviet, Russian forces went up there near Kiev and were abruptly withdrawn very early in the war in Ukraine. I always wondered about that. Putin claims that that was part of a deal, okay? Not a covenant, but at least a deal. Now, what was the deal? The deal was reached with Ukrainian officials in Belarus and in Turkey. 
uh, there was a deal to stop the war, to have a ceasefire, to commit Ukraine not to join NATO, and to bring Russian troops down from where they were threatening Kiev. That's what Putin claims. Now, I checked around because, you know, my memory is just one person, but I found out, yeah, that's probably, that's probably why the Russian troops went down from that area. It's not because they couldn't have taken uh, Kiev, although they didn't really have all that many troops there. But the Russians, from the very outset of their special military operation, appealed to the Ukrainians, look, uh, we'd like to have a deal here. All we want is some respect for our own security. We don't want NATO coming in as a bulwark uh, against, uh, against us. Now, what happened? Well, the Ukrainians talked, and, and they reached an agreement in Ankara on the 31st of March, 2022, and it said these things that I just spelled out. What happened? Well, uh, the U.S., uh, in the person of Boris Johnson from the U.K., he visited Kiev right away and said, no, no, no deal. You may be willing to deal with Russia, but we're not. Uh, we want to continue this thing. Uh, the object here is to give the Russians a bloody nose, a strategic defeat, Okay. And so what did Zelensky do? Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, I won't do that anymore, okay? That's how that thing went down. Now, I remember reading this in Ukrainskaya Pravda, okay? It's the, the official organ in Ukraine. I mean, that's pretty good. But when I had uh, confirmation about this from some of the people who know the military situation a little better than I did, I said, yeah, well, that was, that was correct, too. Now, uh, Wilmer, without belaboring this, I have to tell you <laughs> that after fact-checking all this and trying to offer this as as a, an alternative view by somebody who had fact-checked it, I couldn't get it published. I couldn't get it published on a very, well, what we shall say, a very anti-war website. But, 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 but Ray, that, that, Ray, that's got to be impossible because Joe Biden has told us that we stand for democracy, that Putin is a dictator and that he's an autocrat and we stand for the freedom of press. And so that that's in America, Ray, how could you not get something like that published? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I guess my point, Wilmer, here is that uh, I've long since stopped trying to get something in the Times or the Washington Post. I used to be able to do that 10 years ago, okay? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. twice a year. Uh, but, you know, the alternative media, for God's sake, the progressive media wait, is wait. now saying, oh, that sounds a little bit too pro-Russian. <laughs> God. So here I check these things. I, 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 I double check with the people mm -hmm. who know about things they're not quite sure about. I put it out there and say, well, that sounds a little bit too pro-Russian, we can't run that. So that's the alternative media. That's the bind where nobody wants to feel like uh, they could be susceptible to to uh, criticism of being pro-Putin. That, my friend, is how bad it has become. I was at dinner with some friends, and uh, one of them asked kind of a generic question about this uh, this media. And whose interests are being served. And, you know, this can't be some invisible cabal that is behind the scenes um, being sure that a particular narrative is only being articulated. And I said, no, there, uh, I said, I said it, it doesn't really have to be a cabal because when you, when you look at uh, Jeff Bezos, for example, and he owns the Washington Post and he owns Amazon, and look at where Jeff Bezos has received most of his money from uh, Amazon Data Systems, which is a defense contractor. I said, look at um, uh, what uh, uh, what's the name that owns Tesla, and uh, he controls X, and where does he get most of his money from? SpaceX and Starlink, defense contractors. So. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cabal 
as much as it is uh, the confluence of interests <clears throat> that understand which side their bread is buttered on. Is that mm -hmm. is that fair to say? Well, Wilmer, um, I have an expression or an acronym called the Mickey Mat, the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academia Think Tank Complex. It's in some dictionaries now, okay? Why do I say media? Because the media is controlled by the rest of the Mickey Mat. That's the situation we're in now. Now, you mentioned Jeff Bezos, and you correctly pointed out he gets lots of money from the federal government, CIA, and others, okay? But the people he picks, well, there was a fellow named Fred Hyatt uh, who ran the editorial section of the Washington Post, like the op-ed section, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And before the war in Iraq, uh, about 90% of the op-eds were, oh, yeah, they're weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction. Okay, so what happens? After the war, when there are no weapons of mass destruction, he goes up to the Columbia School of Journalism, and one naive student says, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hyatt, are you kept saying that there were weapons of mass destruction as flat fact, and, and there turned out not to be any? How do you explain that? And Hyatt famously said, well, if, if there weren't weapons of mass destruction, we probably should not have said that there were. <laughs> now, my patron, Robert Perry of recent memory, turned to me at that and he said, Ray, uh, that used to be sort of like a, a cardinal principle of journalism. journalism. Like if something's not true, you're not supposed to say it is. OK, what happened to Fred Hyatt? He stayed in place for 20 more years running the op-ed section. So what's my point? No one. No one is held accountable for these things. That's up to us. We have to find ways to hold people accountable. And what that involves, I leave to, to people, but we have to start getting off our rear ends. We have to put our bodies into it, as I have in the past. They're not going to kill you. They beat you up a little, put you in prison. So, but, you know, it's worth it because so much is at stake right now. And I, I've never seen, I've never seen a more tentative, a, a more dangerous time to include the prospect of the use of many nuclear weapons, which eventually would do us all in. I want to, we have just about a minute and a half or so left, and I want to read, this is from MSNBC, and this is from the uh, April 6th, 2022. In a break with the past, U.S. is using intel to fight an info war with Russia, even when the intel isn't rock solid. <laughs> what that what that means, boys and girls, is MSNBC is admitting that they are lying to the American people under the pretext of the noble lie. They're lying to you, boys and girls. They McGovern, where can people uh think, first of all, Ray, thank you so much for your time today. And uh where can folks find your work? Well, I'm sure that Plato and his noble lie are kind of turning around in the grave right now. Uh, where can people find hey. your work? Oh, where people? <laughs> good, good. Um, well, I'm twittering. That's at Ray McGovern. Okay. Uh, my website is raymcgovern.com. I'm also on Facebook and on Instagram. So. I hope that you'll tune in. Uh, my my son who runs my website always says, Ray, always say, always add, if you don't get it, you, won't uh, you get don't it. get it. But I'm too humble to, to say that. Ray McGovern, thanks for joining me. <laughs> Big shout out to my producer, Melody McKinley. Thank you all so much for joining the Connecting the Dots podcast with me, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Folks, this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Talk without analysis is just chatter, and we don't chatter on Connecting the Dots. Stay tuned for the new podcasts every week. Also, please follow and subscribe, leave a review, share the show. Follow me on social media. You can find all the links below in the show description. I'll see you all next time. And until then, please, treat each day like it's your last, because one day you'll be right. I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Peace and blessings. I'm out.